It is Tuesday, August 20th, 2024. This is another edition of Football Today. You know that dude, Justin Pennick. I am Chris Rose. Bobby Skinner working his way back from the East Coast down to another part of the East Coast, but that would be in Florida. Producer Mikey is back with us as well, which is awesome. Uh, so did you have a nice month together with your buddy, Bobby? Yeah, I kind of got used to it, to be honest, where you know we were traveling. We went to Massachusetts. We saw six different football teams practice in the span of a month. Um, so, and, and we all, we cap it off with watching Daniel Jones throw three of the worst balls that we've ever seen in our, in Daniel Jones's life um, that, that we've seen as Giants fans. So that's how, that's how we cap it off. But um, we're actually going to talk about that mm-hmm. on football today. And then Rose, uh, I, I saw you yesterday on, on Sunday as we're recording this. Um, I saw you on Sunday. You did not see me, but I want to talk about this at the top because I think there's enough people that listen to this show that are that are interested in this. Okay. It was really cool to see the reunion of the Best Damn Sports Show. Yeah, this was so, at Fanatics Fest for people that aren't following along. Fanatics yeah, the Fest ja- was a three-day event. The Javits Center in, in New York City, yeah. Yeah, and, and so, so he put this together. For people who don't know, it's all been all over social media. He put together, think of it as... The sports version of Comic Con. There were stars all over. There was Tom Brady. I saw Jalen Brunson there. Uh, all sorts of WWE superstars. I mean, Gronk was there. You name it, somebody was there. Uh, Kevin Durant. All sorts of people. Continue on. Yeah, and we even had our nice little. We did. Uh, you know, our our show, a two hour show on on a uh, Friday, Saturday, mm-hmm. Friday, Friday. But I, I was there on Sunday, and I, and I and I got a chance to see that. And I'm I'm too young, sorry, mm. Bruce. I, I'm too young to really had to, to have a chance experience to experience that. But seeing all the people up on the stage, and then also uh, hearing uh, Stephen A. Smith's uh, political beliefs for for about a five minute stretch was a uh, was quite fun and, and, and quite interesting. Um, so I mean, just t- tell me about how that went and how you were feeling up there. With all, and also talk, go through all the names that were up there, too, because it was it was really cool. Yeah, for people that do remember the best damn sports show period, it ran for eight years uh, over on Fox Sports Net, and it was kind of the first show of its kind. Um, there was no blueprint to it. We combined sports and comedy. Um, it, we made fun of ourselves. That was the whole idea behind the name is that it wasn't the best sports show ever. <laughs> so that's what every... Um, writer who thought they were witty would write well it's actually the worst damn sports show period and we were like ha, 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 nailed that one so we got most of the almost original cast if you will tom arnold was there john sally was there michael irvin who was there uh for a while john cruck could not be there because of his phillies commitments um and then Stephen a used to come on our show all the time over like a two two and a half year span CC Sabathia used to come on and guest host quite a bit early in his career with the Cleveland Indians. Uh, Jalen Rose was a huge part of what we did. And we kind of, he told us yesterday, this launched his media career. Um, and so it was great to get like the seven of us back together. We had 45 minutes on stage. It flew by. We had a great time. And uh, when we knew we had the opportunity to do something like this, we jumped all over it because we just haven't, we've kept in touch over the years. We just haven't all gotten together in the same place. Yeah, and and and, and I was I was laughing in the beginning, man, because you, you clearly there was like no, there there was no script because he's yeah. Yeah, like Stephen A. And they were all talking about Kamala and this and that, and then Bobby's yelling from the crowd, Canarius Tony, because that's who he wants to vote for for president coming up this uh this election season, and it was a lot of fun. So uh, it, it was really cool to see everybody up yeah. there, and it was cool to see you in that in that element. Yeah, it was great. I love being with, with those guys. We had, um, you know, whether. Whether you like the show or not, which is fine, we did kind of create a path and some history, and um, so I would it's a, it's a it changed my life. That's all I can tell you, and I was really appreciative of the opportunity to get together with those dudes. It was really really nice and fun. Uh, but here we are to talk about football, and week mm-hmm. two of the preseason has come and gone. Thankfully, we are inching closer now. T minus less than three weeks until that first Sunday, two and a half until we actually kick things off. Um, so we can't wait. Today, we're going to play a game of true or false. So we're going to run through a bunch of topics. You tell me whether it's true or false. Let's start in our favorite place this offseason. It certainly feels like Pittsburgh, PA. Both Russell Wilson and Justin Fields played Saturday for the Steelers, and neither could get in in the, in the end zone in their 9-3 loss to the Buffalo Bills. 
True or false that the quarterback situation is worse than we thought it would be in Pittsburgh? I think it's true, Chris. Ooh. I think it's true. Uh, I I kind of got clouded by Russell Wilson's oh EPA and you know hey and we still haven't seen a regular season game at first. We want to know what. Even though these two guys are upgrades over Kenny Pickett, Mason Rudolph, and all the guys that they've tried trotting out the last couple of years, right? Trubisky. Even though they are better, they're still not good. Like Justin Fields and Russell Wilson, and I think especially we're starting to maybe see the curtain, you know, the curtain taken off of Russell Wilson without Sean Payton now and without that security blanket of Sean Payton was able to kind of just push Russell Wilson a- along enough to keep that offense afloat at times and keep it boring or throw it down the field to for a 50-50 ball to court and Sutton. I just, I just, ca- I still can't believe Pittsburgh's thought process of quarterback this off season of, all right, let's go get the two guys that take the most sacks in the NFL. <laughs> that, that was, that's the approach. Not just one. I get like, Hey, let's take a swing on one of them. Not just one, both quarterbacks, take the most sacks in the NFL. And I will say from the week two performance, Justin Fields looked better. I understand nobody scored points. I understand it, it, it didn't, you know, you look on the box score, no, nothing is great. But Justin Fields should have had a touchdown reception, should have had a touchdown throw because he had a receiver that stopped running. Um, he had a really nice sack avoidance play where the pocket co- literally collapsed on top of him. He rolls out to his left, completes a nice ball on the sideline. Russell Wilson took a horrible sack where he could have stepped up in the middle of the pocket. Um, So Fields did look better. And I am still of the belief that Russell Wilson should be starting. But I I had my optimistic kind of glasses on of being like, you know what? These two quarterbacks, they are better than what they've had in the past. But also did not recognize that. You want to know what? These two quarterbacks are still bad. They're bad. Okay. The question is, is the quarterback situation worse than we thought it would be in Pittsburgh? And the answer to that is false. It's not. It's not. Not worse. But the offense is just not good. Okay, now that part is true. Everything from the blocking was horrible this weekend. Yeah, Broderick Jones. Who couldn't play, tricked. so they moved Broderick Jones back to right tackle, and that was abysmal. Um, Jalen Warren is hurt. They're going to be missing him for a while with a hamstring injury. So they want to run the ball, but we're not so sure they'll be able to run the ball with this offensive line. They want to maybe be able to utilize the middle of the field, which is really not the strength of the two quarterbacks that they've got there. So I don't think that the quarterback situation is worse than I anticipated. But when you put everything together in the offense, like the Steelers are going, there's a lot of pressure on that defense to win a lot of games like, 17 13 that is that's tough in today's NFL world it is so hard because the rules are so much against you defensively that you might have a great I mean they gotta they basically have to hold the opposition to like 16 points a game but they do it though that's the crazy thing <laughs> they, they do, do it they do and then they kind of somehow weasel their way in the playoffs but it's not going to get you 12 wins it might get you maybe nine. Like somehow they got they got ten last year, right? With the with that quarterback play, so it's possible. And why I answer true, Chris, is I think I think you and Bobby are a little bit more on the the start fields boat. I mean, or, I would know, just, on- I would just because um, I want to know if there's a possibility that that's the future because they could be totally stuck next year with zero quarterback plan. Right, right, and and I don't view either. The- I think there's a very, very small chance that Russell Wilson is the quarterback. I mean, he could be the quarterback next year, but let's even just say two, three years from now. I think there is a very, very small chance of that happening. So, But I understand why Fields is the better choice just from you you know you could have a future there versus Russell Wilson, there just is no future. But I thought that Russ was going to come out there and look better than what he has and yeah he, i mean like this week was his, two was just really well, bad this was his even though did you see the did you see the uh the incomplete pass to george pickens on the sideline like he yeah. came down with the, that one-handed snag mm-hmm. you want to know who was wide open in the middle of the field and russell wilson was looking right at him 
Listen, bro, his receivers have been doing that in Denver. They've been waving like they're trying to get, you know, traffic to stop. Like, just throw it to me. All right, let's move on. I've had enough. We've talked so much about that. Caleb Williams. A lot of us got to see him. His game, I believe, was on NFL Network again over the past weekend. His stats weren't amazing. A few of his throws were off the charts great. True or false, besides Mahomes, Williams will be the most jaw-dropping deliverer of the football this season. True. True. I've already made two shorts on it in two weeks. And, you know, you can you can leave a comment on TikTok and Instagram and whatever about, okay. oh, you're, 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 you're crowning this guy and this and that. I, at least I'm I'm not. I, I think there are certain things that Williams needs to work on. I, I there there could be accuracy issues. I mean, J T O Sullivan, what what, what did he? He had a couple drives, and I saw J T O Sullivan at the QB school had a forty minute YouTube video on just Caleb Williams as week two. <laughs> so I I think there's there's clearly things that that need to be worked on, need to be polished. You want to know you want to know who Caleb Williams looks like and how much he turns his back. Like he, he turns his back and he'll start running to his left. You want to know who that reminds me of? Russell Wilson. Mm. Russell Wilson used to turn his back and and run away from the pass rush in in, in the same way. And I kind of want to see Chicago like, all right, week week one, we are or the yeah, the week one, not the Hall of Fame game. The week one preseason game, we had a lot of these play action rollouts. It's like, all right, maybe that's just a week one thing. They did it again week two. I kind of want to see him have a little bit more conventional drop back passing so you're not uh, automatically eliminating half the field. So there's things that Caleb Williams needs to work on, blah, blah, blah. But the fun stuff is so freaking fun, Chris. Yeah. And every single week, there are going to be one to two throws that you're just going to go, wow. Yeah. And I love that. And that's why this statement is true. Now, he also could lead the league in interceptions. I wouldn't put that past him. But I will say this, that I truly believe, and by the way, that that number might not be as big because if the if the – Bears are in contention. They are going to want to. They're going to want to give him some help in some other areas. But there yeah, is, for sure. you know, I can't ever remember. I have watched Chicago Bears football for five decades now. I can never remember an offense I've been more excited for in there in Chicago. No, there hasn't. And there isn't one. There just isn't. And, th- and part of that is because of their dreadful quarterback history for the most part. And the fact that let's just be the monsters of the midway and let's run the football and let, you know, like welcome to the 21st century. Here we are. And this is great. It's going to be fun. Uh, he's going to make a ton of mistakes. Great. Let's, let's go for it. Make your mistakes and we'll, we'll move on. But right, this but is going to be a great ride. Like he, he had a mistake. Like, you know, you know, the play to a uh, Odunze on the sideline where he mm-hmm. threw it like a shortstop threw it like right. a, th- like a Jeter jump throw. Right. Uh, to Odunze on the sideline. Well, the play before, he had a clean pocket. It's kind of moving around, moving around. He almost like trips and falls down, and it's a very inaccurate throw to two receivers on the sideline where you don't even know where the ball was going. But then the next play, it's a 30, it's a 30, 40 yard explosive play. And that is what is going to make the Bears offense survive and maybe even thrive. Where if you have those mistakes, it's fine. But you have a quarterback that can make any throw to any part of the football field. You're going to have receivers that can get open at any part of the field, short, intermediate, deep, where if you can, even if you have a third and 10, if you get a 13-yard play on the sideline because DJ Moore gets open on a hitch route, perfect, awesome. That keeps the drive alive. If you have all these mistakes, but you can blink, and then boom, there's Odunze catching a 40-yard pass, puts you in field goal range, puts you in the red zone, and that is just going to change a game, and that's what's going to make the Chicago Bears offense Dangerous, even if it isn't perfect. All right, we're going to move on to um, another former first-round pick. Not first overall, but first-round pick. Daniel Jones played some football for the first time since tearing his ACL. There was some good. There was some not so good. He did connect with Malik Neighbors four, four times, I believe. So that, that part's exciting for Giants fans. But he also found the defense twice, including a dreadful pick six. Afterward, Brian Dayball, if you listen to his press conference, did not sound enthused. True or false, Dayball is over Daniel Jones. I'm going to answer your question first and say true. I think just from a large organizational standpoint, they are over Daniel Jones. But they cannot be for this year. Like, they they cannot, like, there is no, like, okay, well, he's going to, 
you can always go to Drew Locke, and I guess you can always go to Tommy DeVito. But I think that's more, it's way more likely that Daniel Jones gets hurt at some point, or they just want to sit him down for this whole injury clause thing that he mm-hmm. has in his contract. Right. And there's a whole other that complicated stuff that I don't, we don't even like getting into it on Talking Giants since it's so like hypothetical and out there. But I, I don't think they're just going to flat out bench him. Uh, if, if Tyrod Taylor was still here, mm-hmm. there is maybe a conversation because Tyrod Taylor did look that good um, at certain points last year and did look that good under, you know, when he was wearing a Giants uniform. But Drew Locke and Tommy DeVito have not looked up to the standard of challenging Daniel Jones for the starting job. But Dable and the Giants, they're, they do want to move on from Daniel Jones. They wanted to move on from Daniel Jones. But for 2024, they've made their bed. They paid him $40 million a year, and now they're lying in it. Um, and here's what I will say, similar to the whole Chicago Bears point of even if you have an off, even if you have a quarterback that isn't perfect, you can still have other areas that will help you out. The offensive line looked pretty damn good against Houston Texans. They didn't have um, Will Anderson in there. Yeah, I don't let's think not, Autry... let's not turn this into talking giants here. Let's no, no, go. no, no. But here, I'm gonna I, I want to contextualize this, Chris. Okay. The offensive line, I think, is going to be better for the Giants this year. The receivers, led by Malik Neighbors, are going to be better. This is the best supporting cast that Daniel Jones has ever had in his entire career. My running theory and my optimistic Giants fan in my brain is saying that if you have the rest of the team that is better, even if the quarterback is bad. They are going to be better. And that is my saving grace right now, where all we need is Daniel Jones to not make those dumb decisions that he made. The, even the first play of the game was, was a pick six that was dropped by Derek Stingley. So he technically had like three interceptions. Eliminate those bad decisions, and hopefully the rest of the team can elevate Daniel Jones. And we have never been able to say that about a Giants team around Daniel Jones yet in his career. So it's obviously true that they're over him. We know that. Here's what I don't get. There's um, three groups of teams in quarterback situations. One is you are locked and loaded. Those are the Kansas City, Cincinnati's, Buffalo's. We think Green Bay's, like teams like that. There are other teams that are like, we think we've got our guy. We're not 100% sure. Like That would be the Bears, who we all think have a budding superstar, but we just don't know because he hasn't played, right? But it's wishful thinking, and we as football fans are all on board with it. And then there are teams who are like, yay, we got to start somebody in 2024. That's the Raiders, whom we'll talk about later. That's, I think, the Giants right here. But there are teams that, the Steelers, we just talked about them. These are teams that are hanging on for dear life but do not have a plan. And so I think the Steelers might be able to get by because we talked about Justin Fields that he might be it. We don't think so, but he might be it. I have no idea what the Giants plan is. And it makes me go back to uh, late April in the draft. And I know that they couldn't get their hands on Drake May. Maybe they tried really hard and they couldn't do it. But man, like if Bo Nix is anything in Denver, like you're going to sit there as a Giants fan. You're going to be like, all right, so we have to play out the string with Daniel Jones, and then we're going to have a quarterback class that we don't think is going to be very good, and we don't think we're going to go get Dak Prescott anyway, and there's not a Kirk Cousins that's going to be available next year. So what the hell are we doing? That's the complicated thing, because you just mentioned the teams that, all right, well, we're just riding with what we got. You mentioned the Steelers. You mentioned the Raiders. The difference between those teams that are just kind of grinning and bearing it with what they have in 2024 is they didn't give those quarterbacks $40 million. That's true. That's Very the, true. That's, that's the main difference. I know, so but Giants... that doesn't matter. But, Pettick, don't you understand, like, okay, it's a mistake. It is a mistake, and he's going yeah. to be on your team regardless this year, but he will not be on your team next year. Probably not. And I'm not saying that Drew Locke and Tommy DeVito are your answers, but to me, like, if we're to rank the worst quarterback situations in the NFL moving forward for the next five years, the Giants are easily in the top three of that list. Right. I, I think the only saving grace is that Brian Dable's here. And Brian Dable, <laughs> you saw what Brian Dable did with Daniel Jones in 2022. Mm-hmm. You've seen Tyrod Taylor for a long time in multiple different spots. 
You saw what he did with Tyrod Taylor even even last year, and then you even saw what he did with you know Tyrod Taylor in, in Buffalo. I don't think I don't think Dable was there in Buffalo, so I take that back. But uh, you saw what he did with Tommy DeVito last year, right. <laughs> an undrafted free agent. So the saving grace is that you do have Brian Dable with kind of whatever decision that they want to make at quarterback, whether it's a decision that they really do go all in and, hey, if they have the 12th pick in this year's draft, you know they're going to trade up for a guy and they're going to have to give up a lot for a guy if they want to move up. And it's like, all right, well, we just invested a lot in him, but we have Dable and we have the quarterback. Let's roll and let's go. Um, or if it's just another bridge situation. So uh, we'll, we'll see how it unfolds, but Daniel Jones is the guy this year, and it's a weird, murky situation. Everybody recognizes it. Everybody knows it. Um, yet here we are. I hear you. You know what we all need to get more of? Off our ass. And with bold flavors, refreshing citrus kick, Mountain Dew will get you off your ass and have you feeling like you're on an actual mountain. A mountain where the weather is always perfect. Your friends are ready to hang. A day of epic proportions awaits. I mean, you talk about enjoying the outdoor activity. I live in California. People are doing it all the time. They can go to the mountains. They can go to the beach. They can go fishing. You want to play pickup football. You want to throw the frisbee around. You want to go play pickleball. You want to have a longest throw contest. Heck, you want to head inside for a second and put on your headset and play some video games. Heck, you could even do that outdoor if you want to set it up the right way. You want to play kickball with kickball dad. You want to play frisbee golf, golf, wiffle ball, whatever it is, you do it. And you do it with our friends over at Mountain Dew because the mountain is calling. And guess what? You should answer. Go grab your friends, grab an ice cold Mountain Dew wherever refreshing beverages are sold. And just one thing, three words you got to remember, do the do. Uh, let's move on to this. Anthony Richardson coming off an injured shoulder. He only made four starts as a rookie last year in Indy. Before that, he only made 13 in his college career at Florida. Despite a lack of experience, are you confident Richardson will become a star in the league? Or you are confident that he will become a star in the league? True or false? That he will? I've said true for every single one so far. And Chris, I, I'm making an audible where I was going to say true. And I hate talk. What, what's what's the what's our least favorite I word on this show? Injury. Yeah, and that that's why I'm not confident that Caleb that Caleb Williams, that Anthony Richardson will become a star in this league. But you want to know what? Uh, let's pretend that word doesn't exist, like I like to do on this show a lot of the time. I am confident that Anthony Richardson can become a star in this league because of the coach because of the infrastructure that is around him. And also, I, I think he can be that dude. He's a dude that can make every throw at, towards every part of the field. The legs, uh, not taking sacks, extending plays. Um, I think Anthony Richardson can, can be that dude, but it's just that dumb I word that will inevitably may hold him back. So the last guy who got drafted in the first round with his few college starts as Anthony Richardson was Mitchell Trubisky. He only had 13 at North Carolina before the Bears made him the second pick in 2017. Hasn't exactly had a glorious run. He is now on the backup train from city to city. Uh, that will not happen with Anthony Richardson. I just do not see it happening. He is a physical marvel. So this is true. I am confident in him. I've heard nothing but great things in the building about him, which is for a young quarterback, that is the number one box that you have to check. How many guys are not studying their film out of the gate? This guy is in. He is all in. Uh, is he going to have to change the way he plays? No, he doesn't have to change the way he plays. He has to play a little bit smarter. He does have to learn how to slide. He has to learn how to get out of bounds. So he's not taking those extra legal hits. He just, right. that's not changing the way you play. That's just becoming more. By the way, Josh Allen is now in his seventh season and he hasn't quite figured it out yet. No. So, and he's, I think he's gotten fortunate, to be honest with you, that he hasn't missed any significant time because, or any time at all with the number of hits he takes. Like, I don't know how many times on a Sunday I sit there, I'm like, for God's sakes, my man, the rules are there to protect you. Get down. Like, the extra 18 inches you're going to get on the play are not worth it. So, that's all I would say about Anthony Richardson. I just, I want to see him play because he is so different than virtually any, anyone we've got out there. Do you have a team in the NFL this year that, you know, it, it, like I, I think the Colts, like, are they're, they're my team this year, where it's like a sneaky, 
mm. under the radar, but I guess the Colts really aren't that under the radar. They were one game away from, you know, one game and a couple gar- bad Gardner Minshew throws from, well, we're, you know, ruining the Houston Texans' right. great story last year with D'Amico Ryan. So do you, because the Colts are like that, my team, like I could, I could see them if they wind up in the divisional round or even in the AFC championship this year, I'm not blinking and I'm not, oh, I'm, I'm not shocked. That's how much I believe in their ceiling. Do you have a team that's that's like that for you? I got to sit down. We're going to be doing our our you know our brackets yeah. before the season coming up. So I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna dig a little bit. But there's not a team right off the top of my head where I feel yeah. like like my I think I was higher on the Packers than most people. Maybe you had them up there too. Bobby wasn't as high, but I just right. I'm a but even the believer. Packers at this point, like I they. They were in the divisional round last year. Right. They did they, kick I the mean, crap out of the Cowboys. So, but they had to go on a serious run just to make the playoffs to get to nine and eight, and then right, they had right. those two really, really fun games in the playoffs. So they're yeah, not. Their TPPs coming out this week. They were they were two and five. Yeah, and, and I think three and six or so, something like that. It was. Yeah, I think they won six of their good. last seven to get in. Yeah, something like that. All right, the Seahawks. Uh, they rested most of their starters this weekend. They had joint practices with the Tennessee Titans, but there's enthusiasm coming out of the Pacific Northwest because of their rookie coach, Mike McDonald. True or false, besides Jim Harbaugh, McDonald is the most intriguing of the eight new coaching hires. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's that's very true, because I love what, I love what McDonald has been able to do in Baltimore with just taking players who have question marks, taking players who haven't been able to find their ways, and just making them into stars or even taking good players and making them great. It will always be funny to me that the 2023 Baltimore Ravens will always have a fun little place in my heart that Kyle Van Noy and uh, Jadavion Clowney had like career years, <laughs> like especially Kyle Van Noy, who's always been a, who's always been a player. If you're, if you're like a dolphin fan, or if you're like a Belichick tree disciple fan where you've had any of those coaches uh, that have been a part of your team in some form, you have thought about Kyle Van Noy possibly suiting up for your team and being a part of it. And the fact that he had like a career year in year nine <laughs> with the Baltimore Ravens last year is just really funny. Uh, Kyle Hamilton, Geno Stone um, became really good, fo- really good football players too. Patrick Queen almost got $20 million a year. Uh, you know, playing next to Roquan Smith too. And that's from, you know, Mike McDonald coming in and him transforming him as a player a little bit. So this Seahawks defense, Chris, if there is a candidate for a defense to go from bot, like literally bottom five, Mm -hmm. bottom three, and maybe bottom two, and they ain't, and they ain't two besides Washington, I'll say. Look at the talent on this defense. Are you shocked if they're like a top 12? Top 10 oh, no. defense if they make that transformation? No, I've got them this weekend in the Browns' third and final preseason game, so I'm excited to sit there and give it a look. Um, you know, they feel like Reek Woolen is back, and that's going to help them immensely because he fell off. He got benched last year, if you remember. Yeah. And then Devin Witherspoon is a star. Yeah, you know, that kid is going to be right up there. I know everybody talks Sauce Gardner, uh, and sometimes when you get tucked away in the Pacific Northwest, people don't don't think about you much. That kid is going to be awesome. He's going to be yep. great. And up front, like they continue to develop pass rushers. Boye Mafe was really good for them last year. They feel like Derek Hall in his second year out of Auburn is going to be a guy who makes like a uh, uh, a Boye type leap this year. Um, that I, I agree. I think that he's going to be really fun. Uh, he provides good energy, and he's replacing the you know captain energy in Pete Carroll up there. But it is not the right answer. So it is oh. false that he is not, to me, the second most interesting coach. It is Raheem Morris of the Atlanta Falcons, oh. who is now kind of getting a second time around. I know that he filled in in Atlanta on an interim basis, but this is now his second full-time head coaching job. And he was very young in Tampa when he started out there. Very, very young. I'm sure he learned a ton. He's been on Sean McVay's staff, which I'm sure will help him immensely out there um he's taking over a team that is expected to win the division he is taking over a team that people look at and they say we paid nine figures to your quarterback now we brought in a couple of guys and we'll talk about that shortly and judon and simmons it's going to help fortify that defense 
that they've got a ton of playmakers all over the place. Uh, let's let's see what you can do offensively with this club, and you are in charge of the defense, and you're expected to win the division. I really firmly believe that, even though Tampa's won, I think, four straight NFC South. So it's Raheem Morris is the answer. All right, well, let's, well, let's, well we're going to go on to our next true-false question that has a lot to do with the Atlanta Falcons. But I, w- I want to provide one more note of uh, By- Byron Murphy. There have been some film people that have mm-hmm. uh, made some compilations of Byron Murphy this preseason. Oh, Chris, you're going to be calling the game. Um, I, I, he may not even play. That's how, that's how good he's been playing, and they may want to shelf him a little bit. He's had a really fun fun preseason. He's looked like a dude. So yeah, he's a let's, unfortunately, let's unfortunately talk about the Atlanta Falcons. Wow, he's not in on this. <laughs> there was obviously a lot of head scratching when the Falcons took Michael Penix with the eighth overall pick right after giving a hundred million dollar deal to Kirk Cousins, uh, because at the time they could have had the best defensive player on the board that had gone all offense the first seven picks. So they could have had their choice. But now they have traded for Matthew Judon. They have signed Justin Simmons. True or false? The additions of those players make the move to draft Penix seem worthwhile. Oh, it's false. It's false. You could have had Jared versus Dallas Turner. Lot to, you know, if, if that's your flavor. Uh, but are and you are you guaranteeing that those guys in year one are going to be better than Matthew Judon this season? You could have done both. Why not? It's like my favorite taco commercial with that little girl. That's like, why not have both? Mm. And you could have got Justin Simmons. That that would have been awesome. That would have been awesome. And I'm sitting here being like. Oh my God, you have a bunch of young pass rushers with some really good backups and like Arnold D.B. Katie and Lorenzo Carter that are, you know, solid threes and fours instead of making them twos. And you have Jared Ver, you know, a young, a young pass rusher, the rookie, but then you bring in the veteran too that could teach all these guys. It could be the leader in the room and he could be the voice and the go to. And it's like, hell yeah. And you get, and you get Simmons. Hell yeah. And no. Okay, great. I'm glad they, hey, good job getting Judon. Good job getting Simmons. But it just continues to be like, what could have been? What could have been? That's so, it could have been so awesome for the Falcons heading into this year. And also, Chris, why the hell did they play Penix? Why did they sit him? I don't know. Why? I don't know. They played him week one against Miami. And I was like, great. Like, th- these are the only snaps you hope he gets all year in game action. It doesn't make any sense. You're right about that. Oh, we that, saw we saw enough from from week one. No. What? No. That's a head scratcher. Are they the, not? The are only they thing, not rooting for Kirk Cousins? It the, feels like they are rooting against Kirk Cousins. Penix. The only thing that I could think is that maybe their offensive line situation, and I don't know enough to know about their third string offensive line. Let's say to say we we don't feel comfortable putting him back there. For safety's sake. I, just, I, I don't know. That's the only thing I can think of, but it just doesn't make it enough sense for me. But let's get back to the question at hand. <laughs> Is it true or false that it now makes up for it? Yeah, what do you say? So we are not going to know. The Michael Penix situation is, is, is going to receive an incomplete in 2024 and 2025 as long as Kirk Cousins is upright. Like the answer to these questions about Penix won't come for like three seasons. By the way, we might look back on it. Now, you guys might not. I know that Bobby doesn't love Michael Penix, for instance. But what happens if he ends up being a top 10 quarterback? Then are we going to go back and look at that draft and say, you you know what? Joke's on us. Joke's on us. Atlanta's front office was way smarter than the rest of us. Because as important as rushing the passer is, you can trade a third rounder for a guy who's in his 30s, but has been a very, very good player for a long time. You can't trade a third rounder and go find a starting quarterback, most likely. You're just not going to do it. But the Falcons have a very unique offensive situation here where you have Drake London is on his rookie contract. You have B. John Robinson and Tyler Algier on their rookie contracts. You have a young offensive line. You have a very good offensive line. Very too. good. Like not, not even, not even just the young guys. Well, the, they've sunk some, a, they've sunk some cash into that offensive line because they've had right, to pay right. Matthews and Lindstrom. But there's a window is my point, especially on the offensive side of the ball. Kyle Pitts is another one. Like you're saying three years from now, 
if we're looking at Michael Penix being a top 10 quarterback, okay, great. That's three years from now. What does everything else around him look like? Because there is there is a very clear and optimal window now, and that is exactly why you go and you give Kirk Cousins all this guaranteed money because they recognize and they know that they have this window with these skill position players on their rookie contracts that will not last forever, right? Listen, I have a hard time justifying what they did. I really do. I'm trying to see it from the other lens. I am because unquestionably the most important position. And look at all the teams we've already talked about where you're like, God, they, the Giants don't have a plan. The Steelers don't have a plan. Well, the Falcons do have a plan. And we're MFing them as well. The plan should be just Kirk Cousins. And that's a fine plan. It is for two years, but that's not a plan for f- when we talked about a plan, we said five year plan. We know right. that Joe Burrow is going to be the quarterback of the Bengals for the next five years. We know it with Josh Allen and the we know it for Lamar Jackson and the Ravens. Like we know it for all these teams. The Falcons, if they had not drafted Penix, what would be the answer of? Do the Falcons know their quarterback plan? But also, I don't view this as like a as like a five year roster. But why like, can't I, I don't... you? I mean, we're still going to be playing football in five years. No, but, no, but my point is that the core, the core, and the nucleus of it. I think five years from now could be. I mean, forget five; it will be different five years from now. But even two to three years from now, depending on money, depending on resources, where they want Listen. to invest. It will Fine. be so. It will be so different. Where you know, what other NFL team has besides like the tippy top ones, like the San Francisco 49ers, uh, the Eagles are are one where they have uh, dynamic at tight end, wide receiver, running back. Right? They're so unique in that regard that they just have dynamic players at all three of those spots, and that will not last forever. And that's why. It's like uh, the Falcons well, are one of, those, on. the, one of those teams that gets a pass from me for kind of ignoring the five-year plan of quarterback. It can last forever if you have Michael Penix on a rookie deal for two of those years. It can last because the, that's just exactly the way the Niners have done this thing. Right. So, I don't know. Interesting. It's, 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 speaking, it speaking is of, interesting. Speaking of the Niners. Spent a lot of time talking about Brandon Ayuk, and we've obviously mentioned that Trent Williams isn't in camp either. Those contract situations, maybe they'll get resolved soon. But the Niners have also been banged up in camp so severely that they had to cancel their joint practices last week with the Saints. True or false, you're worried a little bit about the defending NFC champs. Yes. Yes. So that's true. Now, does this does this mean that I think they're going to be 8-9? Eight, nine, eight, nine? No, I think they're going to win 10 games this year. But I think the expectation... 10 plus games, but I think the expectation for them is to kind of, all right, well, see us. We'll see you in the NFC championship, San Fran. Well, that's, that's where we'll see you. Um, and really pick things up from there to try and get back to that Super Bowl and try and actually win one. Trent Williams is still looking for a new contract, right? Hasn't mm-hmm. shown up. I view him as a vital, vital piece. I go back and forth on if I, uh, and if I view Debo or Trent Williams as, as more vital, the rest of that offensive line is kind of scary outside of Trent Williams and without him there. So even even forget the whole, all right, you know, he's going to show up. And, you know, the, I, I think everything will be resolved eventually with contract stuff, but they need him to be healthy and ready to rock and roll and beat Trent Williams. The calf strain concerns me on McCaffrey. That's the one when I hear calf, mm-hmm. when I hear hamstring in the months of August and September, that could be something that could linger with you throughout an entire year. And we see it time and time again, every single year in football where, you know, hey, it could be December and January. And then that's when guys, especially running backs and skill position players, that's when they start to really get their legs back under them because they try and come back from these calf and hamstring injuries. Then they sit out, but then they'll try and come back and rush it, but then they rush it and then they hurt it even more, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I am... I am worried about what's the the bad luck that they're that they're getting into right now. I am worried. Uh, McCaffrey was limping around when I was up there. Um, what was it now? Two weeks ago, I guess at camp. Yeah, th- it's. I think they're skating on a little thinner ice than we are used to seeing with them. A little bit. Um, and 
Purdy, I think, has had a pretty rough camp. Like, he's thrown a ton of interceptions, it reads like. I mean, I don't know how much you want to take out of that, but we'll see. I mean, it's the line that worries me more than oh, anything. Oh, God, else. yeah. I just, like, if they were had ever wanted to trade Ayuk, go fortify that offensive line. Not that teams are giving up offensive line and left to right because no, the offensive line right. play stinks in this league. And God almighty, we're going to have quarterbacks running for their lives. They're probably going to come out with a rule pretty soon that you can have an extra offensive line in the game. It's going to be 12 against 11. Like, that's the next rule I think we're going to see. Um, so, yeah, I am, it's true. I'm worried about him, too. I'm worried about him, too. You know, Ricky Pearsall has been dinged up up there a bit. Um, so, I don't know what to say. That's that. It's, that's an easy one for me. Yeah. Uh, Raiders, they made the announcement. Gardner right. Minshew is the guy. Yep, both he and uh, O'Connell, they got right around the same number of throws over the weekend. Antonio Pierce made the announcement, you know, and it wasn't like, hey, he's our dude. It's like, he's our dude. True or false, the Raiders made the right call with starting Gardner Minshew. True. True. I mean, you know, you put the resources in Gardner Minshew. Um, you, know, you, you want to, this is a rebuilding year for the Raiders. This is going to be a process for them. Um, you want to see what you have in Antonio Pierce. You want to see what you have in this roster. You want to see who's going to, who's going to stay, who's going to go. And Gardner Minshew is kind of a good guy to just keep things afloat. But then also they probably will be bad enough to be in a position to draft a quarterback, a quarterback that they will want. Um, does it feel inevitable that Carson Beck is going to be wearing silver and black? I mean, who knows if they're going to. It feels here's right the, to me. Here's Carson the thing Beck, I would say. Las Vegas Raider. Here's the thing I would say is that it is true that this could easily turn into a shit show quickly in Las Vegas. Like where Devontae Adams is out by October. That the I, I want to see Antonio Pierce do well. I, I root for him. I don't always buy into the enthusiasm, rah-rah stuff, the smoke and stogies. Like, I don't know if that works long-term. I think for a half season and the mess that they were in last year, and for them to go from, you know, Josh McDaniels to what they had, great. They, they also named- did win football games, which that, that's, that's, that's the whole thing, Chris. If they win, then the energy will be fun. And if they lose, then it will not be fun. Yes, but I just don't see them winning that many football games with this no. team. I do not see it. Gardner Minshew is a turnover waiting to happen. Um, he can provide some really fun moments, but it'd be like starting Nick Mullins. Like that's that's what it is to me. They're they're almost like the same guy. Like they'll take some chances. Let's do it. Let's let our hair down. Listen, man, this 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 team gets my vote for going off the rails fastest this year. He went seven and six with the Colts last year. And that, you know, we, we just got done talking about how I think the Colts between coach, yep, offensive line, you know, even skill position players are really solid. Pittman, I love downs. Jonathan Taylor eventually came back, and even Zach Moss was running really well. They had a really good running game. So I mean, they went seven and six last year. I can easily I think I think four I think Gardner Minshew can win four games with the Raiders this year. I mean, did they? So the question is, did they make the right call? Yes, they did. Yes. Because yes. I'm not an Aiden O'Connell guy at all. Also, worse mustache. So if we're going to factor that in the equation, yeah. I don't kinda know what's going on. There. It does. Out there. Yeah. yeah, it's just kind of strange. <laughs> and the pick six was not good either against Dallas. That was kind of no. rough. Who knows if that was like the seal the deal sort of move. Like Antonio's like, yep. Okay, check mark that one. He gone. Hey, hey, you, you, hush, hush, Chris Rose. Thanks to DraftKings for sponsoring this episode. Whether you're cheering on your alma mater or just for the love of the thrill of college football, you're going to want to listen to this right now. All new customers who bet just $5 on anything, you will get $200 back in bonus bets instantly. And that's something we can all celebrate along with college football coming right back. That's right. New customers, you can bet just $5 on anything and receive $200 in bonus bets instantly stay in on all the action and use your $200 bonus bets to bet anytime touchdowns on the DraftKings Sportsbook. And did you know that DraftKings is the place to bet on touchdowns? And if sports betting is not available in your state yet, don't worry. You can still join in on all the fun with daily 
Fantasy with DraftKings and have the shot to win cash prizes. So download DraftKings Sportsbook app now. New customers use promo code FOOTBALL today. That's all one word. Bet just $5 on any wager and get $200 in bonus bets instantly. That's promo code FOOTBALL today only at the DraftKings Sportsbook. Sorry I was rude to you, Chris Rose, because I told you to hush. You'll be glad you did. Uh, J.J. McCarthy with more quarterback news. We never had a chance to touch on this. Tours meniscus last week. He is done for the year. Surgery stinks. True or false, that really hampers Minnesota's plans for the 2024 season. False. Doesn't hamper their plans for this year. I think it stinks from a roster building and construction standpoint of not being able to see, all right, well, what does J.J. McCarthy need? Does J.J. McCarthy need interior offensive line? Does he need a, do we really feel like we can run out of 12 personnel and we need that tight end two that can block or receive? Whatever, you know, that's where it stinks, where you didn't get to see J.J. operate in this offense and maybe figure out what he needs going forward or what he needs to improve on or what he does really well. So that's where that stinks. But in terms of this year, no, I I don't think it hampers what they expect to do or what they expect to be this year. Right, Chris? You are. You nailed it. You nailed it. Um, Listen, they're going to roll with Sam Darnold as long as they can. And I don't know if, like, this is the year that, Sam Darnold rebounds, and now he can be a quarterback stopgap where teams are like, yeah, we are comfortable. Like, I think teams feel that way about Jacoby Brissett right now. Yeah, he's, is he going to be the new Jacoby Brissett and just have a job for the rest of his life? Going yeah, I don't, year to know if, I don't know if that's it, but I do know that he is in the right offense to have it happen. Oh, yeah. Right, with Kevin O'Connell and with the receivers that they've got. And, you know, I think their offensive line can be good enough and I like the pickup of Aaron Jones. And hopefully TJ Hawkinson makes it back in time. Um, so, I mean, I, I it sucks for J.J. McCarthy. I was excited to call his game last weekend, and it didn't happen. So from all of that, it's, it delays him a year. And I think we were all curious as, as NFL fans what we were going to see from him because we felt like even though we'd, he had always been right in front of us for the last couple of years in Ann Arbor, we felt like we knew the least about him as an NFL quarterback. Like, we think he can do it, but he was never asked to do that. So what's yeah. he going to be? And that yeah. year, so losing that year is is tough for them. Like, do you think he automatically goes, he's got to, he'll go into camp next year as a starter, won't he? Does Sam Darnold win eight games? Do they go eight and nine? See, but year? I don't Seven think they can afford to do this. This, this is where it does cause problems, but it's not for 2024. All the problems are for 2025. Would you feel good if you're Quasi Adopo Mensa and if you're Kevin O'Connell saying, we are putting all of our eggs in the J.J. McCarthy basket, even though he's coming back from a torn meniscus, even though he didn't have any practice time with us this year, even though he only played in one preseason game, and even though he hasn't shown us the things we need to see at the NFL level because we didn't see him in Ann Arbor. So right. are you willing to make that statement? No, that like that we're investing in him? That he's our guy going into next year, 100%. No. No. Let me play one other thing out for you. What if Jaron Hall has to come in this year? Who was a guy that they started... Remember, he was first guy off the bench last year when Kirk Cousins got hurt, and then he got dinged up in his like first drive as a starter and was concussed. But they like, they love his athleticism. He's got a decent arm. What if he comes in if Sam Darnold's ineffective, and all of a sudden you're like, "Well, dude can play a little bit." Then where are we? And that that's where I think it's different. What what level investment do they put in Jaron Hall? Well, he was a draft pick of this organization, and you know whether you're a first rounder or a fifth rounder, that if you are a quarterback, and all of a sudden, like, you don't think Quazy's going to be like, hmm, I I think I hit on something here. There, he he's an interesting GM where I think they they've been flirting and they've been wanting a quarterback for years, even when even when they're giving Kirk Cousins all this guaranteed money, they've always been poking their head around a quarterback every single year. And I think this was the year that I think they they traded back up into the first round because they thought that they were going to have to trade up to get J.J. McCarthy. It just turns out that they were able to get, you know, they had their one pick of McCarthy and then they were able to get the edge rusher too, which is great. So that's why I think they they stocked up on all that ammo for a reason. So 
Chris, it's interesting, man. Like I, I don't, I don't know where his head's at, and it all kind of does have to depend on how it goes this year. But you know, if you ha- even if you have Donald at seven and ten, and he plays, he plays fifteen of those games, and the uh, and the Vikings finish at seven and ten. I think there's even is is Donald's what's Donald's contract? Is he on the team next year, or is or is it just like void years? Well, I think it depends. If no, 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 he's he's got a one year. What is it, ten million dollar deal or something like that? So it's um. The, the question becomes, did he play well enough to be the bridge guy somewhere else for the team that? Oh, yeah. Gonna... Yeah, it's, it's a one-year deal, and then yeah. there's four void years after this. All right. Let's move on to this. Brandon Aubrey, maybe with a highlight of the weekend for the Dallas Cowboys. 66-yarder. True or false, Pennick? Any field goal made longer than 60 yards should count as four points, not three. False. You don't want to make False. you don't want to make any cha- fun changes. No, not with that. Not with special teams. I hate special teams. You don't you don't like it when a guy kicks a sixty plus yard field goal. You're not like, oh my god, that's pretty cool. You want to know why? Because it usually happens against me. Oh god. <laughs> Are you still? You haven't gotten past the Jake Elliott kick. No, I haven't gotten that. I haven't. I haven't got past. Uh, Gra- Graham Gano made one against against the Giants a couple years ago. So no, um, I. No, no, I, I, ooh, ah, 60 yard field goal. Great. It's three points. So I bring that up because, uh, like 40 years ago, there was a guy who played for the Detroit Pistons named Kelly Trapuca. He was a small forward, really good shooter. If I remember correctly, pretty big ego. And I seem to remember that he hit a, a game winning shot, but it was a long three. And he said that shot was from so far away, it should have counted for four points. So it got me thinking like, huh, is it, maybe he's on to something here. Like, why don't we change it? Wouldn't it be fun if like you're down three and instead of like, and you're at midfield and there's three seconds left and you've got a guy who's got enough leg that you have a chance to win the freaking game because he boots a 67 yard field goal. That wouldn't be awesome. I think guys are getting just so much bigger, so much stronger that I think five, five years from now, 10 years from now, we won't bat an eye at a guy making a 62 yard field goal. Cause they're all these, even these kickers, they're, they're so strong. You could be so athletic. That he, even now it's kind of losing its allure a little bit. Yet, yet that guy, yet that guy in Detroit in the XFL that that nailed him every week, and now he's the Lions kicker. And the, and that was in the XFL, Chris. Oh, for you know, God's sake, you know, Penick, you're no fun. You don't want to change any rules to make it more no, fun. No, I don't. Not it's, I do like the kickoff. Do you? I do because it's 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 different for it's different for right now. Yeah, but. I think field goal, like field goals is is one of those plays that maybe besides an extra point, I, this is how I evaluate it on. Do I want to be on my phone or do I want to be watching it? The kickoff of old, I want it to be on my phone. Mm. I don't care. Got it. A field goal that's even a, that's from basically 40 yards plus, I'm watching and I'm locked in. I'm engaged. There could be a block. There could be a this. There could be a that. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't feel the need to change it. But it's a, I, I, you know what? You know what's funny? I do like the idea of it in basketball. Hmm. It's interesting. I don't know why, because I don't cover that sport, so they can they could fuck around with it however much they want. So <laughs> we've, we've kind of run out of space for the four pointer on the sideline, though, yeah. in the NBA. We've like now it has to be like with a foot dangling out of bounds from the corner. <laughs> um. By the way, just real quickly on the dynamic kickoff, we haven't seen huge returns at all, in part because. All these special teams coaches are saving their shit mm-hmm. for when it counts. So the, you're, they're going to be like design plays, and it's going to go crazy. It, it, there's going to be some moments where you're like, that was fun. So yep. I think we're all kind of excited about that. Last thing, Patrick Mahomes. He threw a behind-the-back pass this weekend for completion to Travis Kelsey. The MVP said he did not do it for show, but rather out of necessity. True or false? I believe him. I do. Now, you know what? I don't. I don't. I don't. You want to know, you, you, you want to know why it's, it's tough to answer this question? 
Because he could just do it. It's not like he has to try. It's not like he, he, he forced it. It doesn't feel forced. It feels like Patrick Mahomes. Like, you know, you see it and it's like, oh my God, well, for, first of all, I was like, I need to clip this. I need to keyframe it. I need to, I need to do a voiceover and a short over it. That was the first thing that I thought of for, you know, for JM football. But then I'm like, okay, this isn't like if Daniel Jones did that, like even Daniel Jones doing the Statue of Liberty during the, during the 2022 wildcard game felt forced and it, and it ended up being four yards, but this was what this was on a third down and it went for a first down, Chris. Well, my, my buddy Brian Baldinger did a good little breakdown of it, and he said, look at where he is. This actually is the only way he could have completed the pass. Wow. But I will say this, because we've seen the clip of Mahomes practicing it for years. Like, I would have waited to use it, although he is going to use it at some point this year. Oh, he will. He, he'll use it at some point this year. And by the way, uh, it is true, I believe him, that it was the only way he could have done it. But... It also, he also did do it for show, which is fine. Like, great. Put on a show, man. You're the greatest showman at that position that I've ever seen. So let's roll with it. Preseason's I, the time to practice stuff. Yeah. Let's go. Why for not? It. I'm in. And that is today's edition of True or False as we covered it. There's 11 guys on each side of the football. We had 11 topics. Bang. That's, that's how we do it. That's actually because I couldn't think of it anymore. <laughs> I, just, I just settled on 11. Uh, we are back at it again later this week. I think Bobby will be rejoining us, correct? Oh, I certainly hope so. Yeah, and then we've got two more shows, and then, well, three more shows, I guess, technically, before the season kicks. And then it's go time, people. It is go time. We're going to be ready to go. We cannot wait till we start digesting real football because the rest of the stuff has gotten, okay, we love preseason, but let's go. It's yep. time for kick. Uh, shout out to producer Mikey, always uh, helping us out painting the pictures and the sounds for us. It's awesome. Justin Pennick. I am Chris Rose. We will see you later this week on Football Today.